Good morning. My name is Marty Stroud. Um, I live in Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, Cattle Parish. Judge Donald said the United States holds the distinction of incarcerating more people per capita than any other place in the world. Well, Louisiana ranks first amongst the states in incarceration rate, and Caddo Parish ranks first among the parishes. So you may say I live in an area where more people per capita are incarcerated than anywhere else, and you would think our city would be safe, but we have the same crime rates and problems that every other city has. Uh, I want to talk a little, little bit about the Glenn Ford case, which is generated some publicity. Al Pacino in the movie and Justice for All states therein winning is everything. I invite, it was a movie back in 1992. I invite you to watch that movie. It has one heck of an opening statement that if given in reality, it would probably cause you to lose your bar license, but it's still a pretty good uh, opening statement. Every day before I started a criminal trial, I would look in the mirror and recite the speech given by George Patton in the movie Patton back in 1970. I don't know how many folks were alive at that time or saw the movie, but that particular speech puts uh, this concept of winning at all cost in perspective. It's a movie, and again, I hope I don't get in trouble for using some bad words, but it starts with the, uh, he stands up and says, I want to tell you that no bastard ever won a war by, <clears throat> by being killed. He won the war by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. He ended the speech with, there's one thing I'm going to leave you with, and you can thank God for it. Thirty years from now, when you're sitting around the fire with your grandchild on your knee, and he asks you, what did you do in the great World War II, you won't have to tell him, well, I shovel shoveled shit in Louisiana. So, um, in that speech, he talks about, he says, Americans love a winner and can't, cannot stand a loser. I'll add a phrase to that unless you're a Chicago Cubs fan. <laughs> <laughs> Americans want to win every time. I wouldn't give a hoot in hell for somebody who lost and laughed. That's why America never will nor will they ever lose a war. The very thought of losing is hateful to Americans. In the Glenn Ford case, it was prosecuted in 1984. He was tried for uh, first degree murder. The jury convicted him in Louisiana. Uh, we do have the death penalty. Uh, he was sentenced to death. Uh, sent to Angola. Spent 30 years in a I'm a cage. I don't know if anybody's been on death row, but it's certainly not a, of their states. He got out one hour a day. He maintained his innocence every time, every day. Thirty years later, this year, evidence was uncovered that that showed that Mr. Ford had not committed the offense. This in information was gotten from an, <clears throat> in, a, in a collateral investigation and in the motion to dismiss filed by the state, there was a statement, if this information had been known to the state at the time, there wouldn't even been enough information, enough to arrest the guy, much less convict the guy. I felt I was, I was in my early 30s at the time, and at that time I was full of, you know what, in vinegar. I felt like I was a fire eater. I went after him with everything I, I got. 
Um, I was sure he was guilty. I believe I was. We were in the second part type of case that Mr. Talbert talked about. And when that hit me, it hit me like a a, a ton of rocks. I I just I couldn't believe it. Um, anyway, Mr. Ford was released, and on top of that, he had developed lung cancer while he was on death row. And he applied for, for compensation from the state. Some states have compensation statutes, others don't. Louisiana has one. When he was released from Angola, and this is probably the most, the, the fact I remember every day in my life, and I will talk to I die. He was released from being in a cage for 30 years, and as he walked out of Angola, he was given a $20 gift card along with the apology, sorry for the inconvenience. Now that is, we've talked about justice in this case. That's about the farthest thing from justice that I can think about, can find. As I say, he sub subsequently, uh, and he subsequently died from lung cancer. He had filed a, a, a motion for compensation, and under Louisiana's compensation statute, they, they take with the left and give away with the right. They said, yeah, you can get compensation if, number one, you can factually prove your innocence, and number two, that you don't have any other, federal, any other type of, of felony conviction. So under that statute, the judge ruled that this man who had spent 30 years on death row for a crime he didn't commit was not entitled to compensation. Um, I was sitting in, at home and just hanging out with my cat and um, there was an editorial in the Shreveport Times about this. And I picked up a pen I, and I started the letter. I said, I've never written before and I'll never probably ever have occasion to write again. But this man deserves compensation. I was also, I also set forth that I thought that the, the argument that the system did it, we make mistakes, you didn't do anything wrong, you were just doing your job, don't worry about it, you probably did something else. Those statements finally just, I, I, I got sick of hearing them. So in the letter I wrote, I, I told, I wrote that I was the lead prosecutor and as such I take responsibility for the wrongful conviction. I take responsibility for the wrongful conviction because Mr. Ford had two attorneys, none of which had ever tried a case, and I remained silent. The prosecution ran over the defense like when I was young I saw a, a New York Post or Saturday evening, post, whatever they had, and on the front was a picture of, of Mussolini's tanks uh, coming into Ethiopia and, and the uh, natives were using spears trying to stop the tanks and I never forgot that picture and, and that's what happened in this case. We had everything, they had nothing. It was an unfair fight and we, we, were, we were there trying an individual for capital murder. Number two, it was an all-white jury. Now back in 1984, I think the law was on, on using peremptory challenges was that unless you could establish a systematic exclusion of African Americans then you did not have cause for a challenge in a particular case which to me is an impossible burden for the proponent to meet to make. While the case was on appeal the Batson case came out which changed, which changed it, the equation somewhat but the judge found nothing wrong with, with the, with the uh, composition of the jury. Third, the third thing I sat back and did nothing about is they didn't, these two attorneys didn't have any money, they didn't have any 
uh, know how to put on a mitigation defense. Uh, Lynn Ford's wife showed up from California to testify in the mitigation phase, and this unbeknown, unbeknownst to me at the time, a bailiff outside said, well, it's too late, the mitigation case is, is about over, so she turned around and went back to California. I didn't find that out until later. And basically, they put on the defense. Glenn Ford took the stand without any preparation, and I cross-examined him, and I, I, it was just, I guess, a prosecutor's dream to have somebody, you know, at the time, easy to cross-examine. But he said one thing to me. I said, what do you want to tell this jury? And he said, I want to tell this jury that I'm not guilty. And I said, why? They, they've just found you guilty. You're saying that they're a bunch of uh, idiots? Or some prejudicial remark to that effect. And he, he looked at me and he said, no, sir. I think they're wrong and I want time to be able to prove my innocence. And that's another statement I remember every day because, in fact, his innocence was established years later. I met Mr. Ford uh, shortly before he died and we had a conversation. Uh, I apologized to him. I told him, I mean, I asked for forgiveness, and he said, I can't do that just now, but I'm working on it. Uh, I said, well, I understand. If I were in your shoes, I probably would, couldn't forgive me either because I did a lot of uh, horrible things in this case. The point being is that at the time, I, did I go out to knowingly convict an innocent man? No. I didn't think I had an innocent man. Once I locked in, I didn't worry about Brady. We had a case, we had a solid case, this was an individual that should be prosecuted, and I had done my job. That was this idea of win winning at all costs. Now, Brady to me meant, and I'm, how many of you, I, it's happened to me a lot since I've been a defense attorney, you ask for Brady material and you get a reply from the prosecutor, we've looked at the file, there is none. I get that about 90% of the time and that means you gotta, you gotta follow up. I did the same thing then. I'd heard rumors about other people being involved. I asked the investigators or if anything to that. I was told no. My failure there was not to follow up. Um, I've had dreams about the case where I stand up in the middle of the trial and just scream, stop this injustice. Um, as I say, this does not have, this story doesn't have a happy ending. Uh, I believe Mr. Ford is, is in a better place now. And I realize, and I realize that uh, uh, my mistakes of in judgment led to this man being on death row. Brady, there you have the interplay between winning all costs and Brady. I told when I was a first assistant, when somebody came in. And, and we discussed their case, we never discussed Brady. When you were being evaluated for a raise, there wasn't a question about Brady on there. Did you turn over exculpatory materials? Nobody came in after a loss and said, well, you know, Marty, um, it's a tough case, we lost it, but by God, I complied with Brady. <laughs> that didn't merit a raise in our office and probably no other office. I think, particularly in, in and I'm, I'm speaking for, from my, the perspective of my state, 
Brady, I don't believe Brady's incapable of being enforced without judicial intervention. I think the presumption that prosecutors act in good faith, that was a basis, I think was a Brady, just hasn't worked. A lot of prosecutors have, are in good faith. We've all run across them, and we know who those people are. But there are other prosecutors who don't. There and it depends on the judge. If the judge doesn't want it, if you ask for an in-camera inspection, does a judge look at it? Does a judge not look at it? In our in our jurisdiction, that doesn't happen that often. They rely on the uh, prosecutors representation. Actually, Marty, I'm going to switch over to Lane because there's some points we're going to be able to circle back and follow up May on. May I say one more thing? Absolutely. And I didn't mean to cut off. <laughs> See, another, <laughs> he's from Alabama and I'm from LSU and we got a big bad rivalry going here. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> what got me though, and I, I would recommend if you've never seen the movie Judgment at Nuremberg with Spencer Tracy, at the end of the movie, he, he's the lead judge, and when he comes out, he says, we want everyone to know that the principles of the, this tribunal, coming for this tribunal are truth, justice, and the individual dignity of every human being. And I feel that in my treatment of Glenn Ford, he was denied that individual dignity that he's entitled to under the law. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.